Welcome back, everyone. If you're able to, please head over to our subscription channel where for a couple bucks a month you'll be able to watch the full-length versions of these episodes. Not only will they be full-length, but uh, you'll also see them a little bit earlier and you'll be directly supporting the rebuild of Hawker Typhoon JP843. Now, for episode three, we're going to pick up right where we left off in episode two, the full-length version, which is just after the cockpit structure. This will include the integrating structure all the way aft to the tail of the Typhoon, and will include some information on why the Typhoon lost its tail in flight early on. So thank you for following along, guys. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for free, or if you're able to, to our full-length subscription channel. Cheers. Moving aft from the cockpit section, we have what I mentioned earlier as the integrating structure, and that's those forged fittings that connect to the uh, uppermost and lowermost four points on the rear of the cockpit. Those fittings transmit through more T50 steel tube, all of the forces between front and rear fuselage um, through frame A, which is the heavy frame on the forward monocoque section. The tubular structure of the integrating structure attaches to frame A through more forged aluminum fittings that are embedded in this heavy double frame. From there, the next frame aft, frame B, is a single frame but it is of heavier than normal construction and the next one aft from that is a double frame of light gauge construction called frame C. Between frame A and C there's four heavy, uh, I'd call them almost a lingeron section, uh, in place of the stringers that run aft of those main forged points that the integrating structure attaches to. A nice visual for those four heavy sections is right here. We happen to have one. And you look at, uh, this is a broken attachment point at joint Q on the Hawker Typhoon. Uh, joint Q being uh, the reference given to both port and starboard uh, nine and three o'clock positions for the mounting of the integrating structure. So it transmits the loads direct from the tube to this and then carries them back. This is frame A, this is frame B, that's the heavy construction single frame, and then right here is frame C, which is a very light gauge, uh, it's 28 thousandths of an inch, uh, double frame that stringers run through. As you can see, there's a stringer here and it runs through up to A and it also runs through B. These heavy sections also run through uh, from fixed at C to uh, through frame B and up to frame A and they're attached in another fairly substantial fashion directly into that casting. Uh, up here you can see the side plates and these attach the framework within frame A of aluminum tubing and plugins. So you can see here the, the depth of that heavy section and uh, I'd have to double check but I believe it was approximately 80 thousandths of an inch so a fairly substantial piece to form that has 3 16 fasteners that attach it and this area of skin around all four of these heavy structures is actually a double skin uh, just more rigidity more dissipation of that stress aft when we look at the design of the forward monocoque section you can see that Every one of the frames, while a complete ovoid, has four splice points on it. And this again was production efficiency. The monocoque on the Typhoon was built in four sections, completely skinned and manufactured with stringers and their rib segment on each four section. And they're built individually and then brought together on a final fixture and assembled. You'll notice with JP843, we're producing it exactly as they did uh, structurally and design wise, but having that many people working also means you need that many different fixtures and it's just not the way to do a one-off aircraft. Perfect for production, low production noser. When we look at the fuselage, this is our bare fixture at the moment, um, and you look at the history of the Typhoon, one of the biggest things that stands out if you're discussing the airframe is the transport joint. Now the transport joint is a technically detachable point at which the forward monocoque section here can be detached from the rear monocoque which is the uh, integral fin and attachable tail planes. But when you look at the Typhoon, the design of this transport joint early on was 
in my opinion, a very poor design. And it, it didn't seem to transmit stress very well. That said, and aside from the fact that the transport joint is what failed, it wasn't the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem was elevator flutter, and it took them a long time to figure out what it was. And unfortunately, many people died. And even more unfortunately, it's because the war was on and they couldn't stop production of these aircraft. So they were working with the air ministry very, very hard to try and solve this. Ultimately, uh, many months had passed, and in 1943, resonance testing on the airframe proved that the flutter was caused by vibration, which led to failure at weak points. Now, if you look at the evolution of the repair for the transport joint, when they didn't know exactly what was happening, they sought to repair anything in the area that um, was identified as a weak point from any recovered components of tail fail aircraft. When they did this, they looked at a great number of faults that were discovered, including some cracking on the uh, root end of the main spars in the tailplane and some other uh, buckling and wrinkles that had formed on the aircraft. All of these small faults that were discovered during the investigation were repaired. And they, um, if you look at the modifications for the Hawker Typhoon, there are significant repairs in the back end, which include reinforcing of the tailplane inner spar, um, additional quarter frames initially that led to full frames, changes in rivet patterns. At one point, they had a steel strap around the transport joint because it was known to be weak and uh, ultimately they ended up putting fish plates around the transport joint. And these were to carry the loads between stringer sections across that transport joint. Now, none of that solved the problems. Aircraft still failed with the new fish plate modifications. And it wasn't until one Hawker Typhoon pilot from a tail fail aircraft survived that they were able to get the last little bits of evidence that they needed. And along with the resonance testing, specifically the resonance testing, they proved that there was a node on the tailplane causing flutter, which ultimately led to the failure of the transport joint. So in rectifying this, Hawker added a new balance weight to the elevator system, and they also added an inertia weight to the uh, control column in the aircraft. So I'm back here in quarantine. I'm allowed out, but <laughs> the parts aren't. Um, I just wanted to show you the, uh, the inertia weight that was added to the control column on the Typhoon. So here's the inertia weight. It's six, it is 16 pounds. So it's quite a substantial chunk of lead there, uh, but it does fluctuate. There's at the time that this fix came into place, they were also looking at fitting the large tailplanes to the Hawker Typhoon and a four-bladed propeller. So there's a lot of uh, weight variations depending on the configuration of the Typhoon in question. In this case, uh, for our Typhoon, a small tailplane, three-blade propeller aircraft, that's a 16-pound weight. But it solved the, the problem. When they had the inertia weight and the counterweight on the elevator mass balance, the issues of tail failures were resolved. And now the fish plates were not needed at that point, but they were left on and they proved to be quite comfortable to the pilots that had to get into these aircraft. Uh, just to touch on the next aircraft in evolution, which was actually the Typhoon II, uh, later to become the Tempest, it used a completely different te uh, transport joint after the Tempest V uh, Series II. They had changed it to an extruded transport joint. Um, again, more, more of a design change because it just makes sense. It's a good design, and that's what we're going to have on Hawker Typhoon JP843. Now that's the rearmost point of the forward monocoque section of the Hawker Typhoon. The transport joint consists of, in either design configuration, it consists of frame K and frame L. Frame K being the rearmost forward monocoque frame, and frame L being the forwardmost rear monocoque frame. The rear monocoque goes from frame L to the stern post slash fin post um, of an integral fin monocoque section unit and it houses the retractable tail wheel. This section again just as the forward monocoque was reinforced this section had some reinforcing with the addition of a, um, a modification quarter frame identified as frame M and fitted to the lower section. Ultimately this would 
become a full frame at that location as well. The rear monocoque is a very similar design. It's got a series of frames and stringers, but it also includes some diaphragms and uh, diagonal bulkheads for rigidity around the tailwheel pivot point. The fin unit and the rear monocoque are built separately again uh, to maximize production, but they're assembled as an integral unit and not easily um, detachable after manufacture. Now the, the fin and tail are another neat item on the Typhoon that I think many of you will probably know that there's a small tailplane and a large tailplane Typhoon. The small tailplane was uh, the original one with the large one being an adaptation of the Tempest tailplane that was in design at that time and likely early production. The difference between the tailplanes, uh, small and large, is actually quite subtle. It's the nose ribs uh, were extended to give more surface area as well as what they call the washout and what I would normally refer to as the tailplane tip. So those were modified and as such the elevators were also modified and a larger airplane. There's greater surface area with this modification and it led to greater stability. The insides or the internals of the tailplanes remained identical. The main spars were identical and the interspire ribs were identical as well as the mounting points. So it was a fairly easy production switch to, to produce these other tailplanes. Now alongside the tailplane substitution or the tailplane uh, modification, there was also different fins fitted to the Typhoon. Now the first one is a very small fin and that, that didn't last long at all. The second one and main production fin is what you will see on Hawker Typhoon MN235 and very fortunately it's the exact same fin that uh, Hawker Typhoon JP843 was built and flew with. There was however a third fin for the Typhoon and it was near identical to the one um, on, that will be fitted to JP843, but it was reduced in thickness. And I, I haven't gone too far into the research beyond uh, JP843's production, but I believe it coincided with the uh, modification to larger tailplanes. So there we go. That's our introduction to the Typhoon structure. I hope you guys learned something. It'll definitely help with how we proceed and uh, a common understanding of parts and assemblies as we explain progress of the project. Please join us again for episode four, where we talk to our designers and uh, see what it takes for them to take all of this old information and reverse engineered data to produce CAD files that are ready for production.